Welcome to this second lesson. We will discuss measurement of precipitation. Precipitations are measured in liters per square meter on horizontal surfaces. This is the definition. And one liter of water over a horizontal surface of one square meter yields a layer of one millimeter. This is why a common unit for measuring rainfall volume is in millimeter. Precipitation gauges are illustrated here. A typical gauge consists in a kind of bucket with a normalized opening to collect water. Rain gauges can induce perturbations to the measurements by deviating the rain. Another difficulty is that the measurement cannot be repeated and it is only representative of one location, so the region should not be too heterogeneous. Finally, the rain gauge should be placed in an open environment without any shelter to capture all the precipitation, but also protected from wind or any other perturbation. As an example here, we can see how the wind speed could affect the measurement made on a horizontal surface. The main drawback of simple rain gauges is that the bucket has to be emptied on a regular basis daily, twice a day, or another, any other interval, and this has to be done manually by an operator. A tipping, a tipping bucket rain gauge is illustrated here. This is a more automatic system. The device tips each time a given amount of water, generally one-tenth of millimeter or two-tenths of millimeter, is collected. The number of tiltings is recorded and can from, and from there the quantity of rain can be determined. Of course, uh, there can be an automatic recording of this tilting and this can be a transmitter through a wireless network or just stored in a local hard disk. It depends on the countries and the locations of the gauge. Here, here are some illustrations of some such rain gauges with a typical bucket device here in the middle. You see that the quantity of water is not large, the size is not so big. We will now illustrate this through an example using data collected in Haiti with tipping bucket rain gauges. This example concerns the basin of the Cavaillon River located in southern Haiti. So the river flows here, as you can see. The hydrographic network in the Cavaillon River basin is illustrated here. The main river is, of course, the Cavaillon River, passing through the city of Cavaillon. And the rain gauge is located here at Dory. This table reproduces the direct measurements by the tipping bucket gauge. The volume of rain for each tilting of the gauge is 0.2 mm. If we look at the data recorded, for example, here at 11 p.m., 12 minutes, we can see that there were four tiltings, resulting in a volume of 0.8 mm. The data are then usually aggregated over larger time intervals, like, for example, 5 minutes, 30 minutes, um, or a hourly or daily basis. Hourly data for the station are presented here. We see that around 1 p.m. here, almost 35 mm of rain were recorded during a, a rain event that occurred at, at that time. Here, the recorded data are presented on a daily basis for the month of April, comprising the 2 of April heavy rain that we have seen just before. The volume of rain is expressed in millimeters, as we have already said. The volume for a given time interval, which is equivalent to a kind of discharge of rain, is called the rainfall intensity. The rain intensity I, calculated as delta H over delta T, is thus expressed in millimeters per hour. For a given time step, 5 minutes, like here, 10 minutes or more, it is possible to determine the largest volume of rain during the rainfall event. 
and then also the maximum corresponding intensity. Intensities are calculated for the different rain durations in the table here. It can be observed that the intensity decreases with the selected time step. We have here the largest value and the lowest value here at the end for a large time step of 12 hours. This is consistent with a common observation that when it rains, the rain becomes less and less strong with time. Daily precipitation data are often publicly available, as for example from the Public Authority of Wallonia. You have the website here and you can check by yourself. For each day, the total amount of rain is indicated. And for example, we can see that here on October 7 in 2009, this day was a very wet day compared to other ones with um, about 80 millimeter and the other values are much lower. We can see here a typical distribution of the rain uh, rainfall uh, recorded during uh, during one day. For example, you see here each hour of the day and then um, the total precipitation. So we can follow the, the evolution of different rainfalls. For example, we see that here for this day, we, we can identify a rainfall event, for example, here, another here, that are strictly um, limited to that day, because here at uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, there is no rain, and here at the end of the day, there is no rain also. But this delimitation is not always so simple. For example, if we look here, we see that it started raining at 5 p.m. that day, and the rain continued until here, until 3 o'clock in the morning. So in the reality, this will be recorded as two dist distinct rainfall, uh, two distinct rain event. Although we can see clearly from here that it is only one single event. However, considering the number of recorded data that we have, such small errors finally uh, don't won't affect a lot the accuracy of the measurement. So knowing all the daily precipitation, it is now possible to calculate monthly totals, like here, for different years, and then also average monthly precipitation. We can see, for example, that July, here and August, appear to be the wettest months in Belgium, which is maybe unexpected as these months are summer months. Adding the monthly totals yields the annual precipitation, and it can be observed that in the illustrated period, 2002 here was a very wet year compared to 2003 that was very dry. Averaging these values yields the average annual precipitation. That is for this particular station of Wavre, close to Louvain-la-Neuve, close to the university, 825 millimeter. This is close to the average in Belgium between 800 and 850 millimeter per year. So we can consider that the Belgian annual rainfall is about 800 millimeter and we can compare this value to uh, the values obtained at different locations in Haiti. Haiti is known as a quite dry country where irrigation is needed for agriculture. However, in some parts of the country, like here, annual averages are more than here, or uh, rather here, annual averages are more than double of the Belgian values. In fact, due to the high temperatures, the rain almost immediately evaporates and no infiltration can occur in the ground. Moreover, severe deforestation makes the problem even worse. So we can easily imagine that for a given station, huge amounts of data are produced by those measurements. Therefore, we need a means to summarize the observations in order to characterize a given station. 
This summary can be provided by the intensity, duration, frequency curves. We can illustrate the construction of these curves through the measurements conducted by engineer Grisolet in Paris, in Paris for a period of about 50 years. He analyzed 1,582 rainfalls using data from the Parc Montsouris, the oldest weather station in France, with the following se selection criteria. More than 6 mm or more than 4 mm but then with an intensity larger than 30 mm per hour. Looking at the data collected uh, by Grisolet on June 23 in uh, 1936, we see again that the rain intensity decreases with time. Looking at the duration of 30 minutes, we see that the corresponding intensity is 76 mm per hour. If we now take the most intense rainfalls with the duration of 30 minutes over the analysis period, we can see that the previously identified event ranks first. It is the most intense event observed for a duration of 30 minutes over the analysis period. Going back to the rain event of June 23, we can ask ourselves the question whether this event is the worst for any duration of rain. Let us consider now the duration of 40 minutes, for which the intensity is 63 mm per hour. Compared to the other 40 minutes events, it now ranks only second. So repeating this analysis for different reference durations, we can for each of them identify the worst event. As the period of analysis lasts about 50 years, the corresponding return period is estimated to 50 years. Then, the events occurring, for example, five times over the period are assigned a return period of 10 years, and this can be done for other periods. These values can be represented in a convenient graphical way as illustrated here. Talbot in 1904 proposed this formula to express the decrease of rain intensity with the duration of rain. So, and we have two parameters A and B that depend on the particular station. The different curves correspond to different return periods that can be determined either in a simplified way as done by Grisolet or after more rigorous statistical analysis of the data, as you can see here um, from the uh, Walloon Public Authority website. Other representations exist, such as the Montana curves with an exponential formulation. Such a curve is illustrated here for Louvain-la-Neuve. We have seen that the huge amount of data collected at rain gauges can be summarized under the form of IDF, intensity, duration, frequency curves, for a given station. And this yields useful information about the precipitation regimes at the station. We can see here the distribution of rain gauges in the southern part of Belgium. But how could we determine the expected precipitation at this green point where no gauging station is installed? And how could we determine the average rainfall over a larger area, for example, the whole area illustrated here? Let's start with a single point. The simplest method is that of the nearest point. Knowing the precipitation at each gauging point indicated by black points, the precipitation at the blue point I is taken as the value at point K, which is the nearest to I. The inverse distance method is a weighted average method that is illustrated here and is more accurate, of course, than just the nearest point method. Pi is the precipitation at a selected point I, while Pk represents the precipitation at neighboring gauges. Dik is the distance between point I and each neighboring gauge. Alpha here 
is an exponent and usually its value is equal to uh, 2. To determine the average precipitation over a larger area, for example an entire uh, catchment, two methods can be used. The methods of isoyet and the Thyssen polygons. We will illustrate the two methods with the example of the Vidourle catchment in southern France. The city of Sommières is often subject to severe floods due to heavy rainfall in the mountainous area of the Seven here. In this area, several rain stations exist, as illustrated here by the red points in the figure. For each station, the annual rainfall is indicated, and using this data and the inverse distance method to interpolate values at intermediate points, Together with the knowledge of the topography, it is possible to represent lines of equal precipitation between the rain gauges. Topography is useful for this kind of interpolation, as precipitations are generally larger for higher altitudes, in such a way that isoyets often follow terrain contours. So such lines of equal precipitation are called isoyets, and the expected precipitation um, at a location situation between two isoyets, for example, this green point here, can be obtained by interpolation using, for example, the inverse distance method that we have seen just before. The main difficulty, however, in this method is the construction of the isoyets, as it requires a good knowledge of the topography to account for um, mountains and a possibility of orographic precipitation. Here is an example of isoyets of extreme rainfalls in Wallonia, the southern part of Belgium. Rainfalls with a duration of 24 hours and a return period of 20 years are considered. We can see that the most eastern and southern part of Wallonia, here and here, are the wettest, at least regarding extreme events. The method to average precipitation values over a, a larger area, the second method that we will present, is the method of Thyssen polygons. The idea is to divide the territory into areas of influence of each rain gauge which means then that in such an area, each point is closer to the corresponding rain gauge than to any other gauge. To do this, the first step is to construct triangles with the rain gauges as summits. Then, for each triangle, the perpendicular bisector of each edge is plotted as indicated here in red. Doing this for each triangle results in polygons around each rain gauge, which are the Thyssen polygons. Each point in a polygon is closer to the related gauge than to any other gauge, so the polygon represents the area of influence of the gauge. Constructing the Thyssen polygons over an entire catchment yields a result as illustrated here. The areas of influence of each rain gauge, each black point, can be clearly identified. So the average precipitation over the catchment PM here can be calculated like this, with PK being the precipitation value at each gauging point and AK the area of the corresponding Thyssen polygon. We have seen different methods to extend rain gauge data. However, it must be kept in mind that these methods are valid only if a sufficient number of rain gauges is available over the territory. Otherwise, other specific methods dedicated to poorly equipped areas should be used. These won't, however, be discussed here. And with this, we've finished this lesson. See you for the next one.